Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Got to get the cobwebs out. This is a deep discussion this morning, so I want to see some energy. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. There you go. Okay, first of all, I'm going to start with a question. Mr. Pittman, are you ready? Okay. When you think of a sheep, what comes to mind? Anybody? Uh, first of all, there is shepherd, and then second of all, sheep just wander about and go, they go ahead anywhere. So without a shepherd, they can go straight. That's right. And can you ch uh, train a sheep? Do you ever see them up front uh, doing all kinds of activities for children? Are they trainable? Not the smartest, <laughs> Not the smartest animal, that's right. But they're so cute. Okay. Keeping that in mind, see if this will work for me. Apparently not. Ah, okay, I gotta point that way. All right, so blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. My name is Kelly Simmons and I will be the facilitator today. And uh, I thank you for being here. As I said, this is a deep discussion every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we are going into the meat of it and everybody takes something different from that. So we'll see if you did your homework. The verses on the screen are small because I want you to look up the Bible verse in your Bible or on your phone uh, so that you can follow along. So the main beginning is the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner this is the lord's doing it is the, is marvelous in our eyes again very tiny right so we're going to we're starting in psalms and i didn't realize how tiny that would be okay the Psalms tell us about the feelings of their authors and their relationship with God, but they are not limited to that. The Holy Spirit uh, inspired its authors to clearly express various essential aspects of the plan of redemption. Thanks to Psalms, we can see how God has arranged the events of the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. So first, the shepherd, found in Psalm 23, we'll be reading that. The suffering Messiah, Psalm 22. The son of David, Psalms 89 and 132. The eternal king, Psalms chapter 2. And the heavenly priest, mostly found in Psalms 110. So first, Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Pretty plain, yes? So first we're going to start with the good shepherd. Psalms 23, Psalms 28, verse 9, Psalms 78, 52 to 53, Psalms 79, 13, Psalm 80, verse 1, and Psalm 100, verse 3. There are so many Bible verses in this. Before we go any further, though, I want to keep this in mind. Uh, as we are reading these, I want, you're going to answer it. How is the relationship between the Lord and his people portrayed in these texts? Psalm 23. Everybody can say this with me. The Lord is my? I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, keep that in mind, and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Psalm 28, verse 9. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. Psalm 78, 52 to 53. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them to safely. So they are they that feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. That's a visual aid for you. Psalm 79, 13. So we, thy people and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Psalm 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a... Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the... So the thoughts from that were guidance, because he's leading us. Sustaining care. People depend on God to meet their needs. Feed them. As shepherds lived with their flocks, so we can picture that God was living with us, his flock. And the question, where do you see this imagery of the Lord as the good shepherd fulfilled in the life of Jesus? Anybody? I am the good shepherd. Anyone else? Turn with me to John chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. Anybody want to read that for me? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Anybody? Oh, do you want the mic? No. Someone back there want a mic? Oh, I'm sorry. But he who enters the door is like the sheep, the shepherd of the sheep. To him. The gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears a voice and calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his out, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Now we'll continue, uh, 7 to 18. Anybody else want to read? Did you, Ruth, would you want to read, read that for me? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And 7. What was the verse? 7 to 18. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever come before me are the thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an heirling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catches them, and scatter the sheep. The hairling fleeth, because he is an hairling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep... I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, 
and one shepherd. Therefore, does my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I, am, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Doesn't that say everything? The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And who is the thief? I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and they know my, and am known of mine. And as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10, 27, 28, My sheep hear my voice and know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So further thoughts from that, sheep know the shepherd's voice. To current day, Middle Eastern shepherds can divide their flocks that have mingled simply by calling their sheep who recognize and follow. I love that image. The good shepherd never forsakes his strayed sheep, but searches to save them. He is willing to die for his sheep and became the sacrificial lamb. Okay, Matthew 10, 16 and Luke 10, verse 3. Jesus calls his disciples sheep and lambs. What reasons do we have to be thankful for our good shepherd today? Anybody? Put your hand up if you're willing to speak. Okay. Mr. Pittman? Well, he says that he will lay down his life for me, so why shouldn't I be thankful? That's right. That's right. Anyone else? He makes me lie down in green pastures. So green pastures means all is well, even though in, in the eyes of humans, it looks like it's not well. Trusting him and knowing that he will make you, even if you don't want to, he will make you lie down in green pastures. So for me, that's... Comforting. Yeah. Yes. May I say something about Absolutely. our Lord? Uh, when he was here on earth and when he went through and got the apostles and all this and all, and all the things that he had to do, the apostles figured that he was going to be the king in that day mm -hmm. and look after things. But when Jesus showed, showed what he was going to go through, well, it looks like to me, like they were sympathized, but they like abandoned him at the time when he was being crucified and so on. And he was the loneliest person, I say, in the universe right there and then. The loneliest. No one had pity on him. To me, I can understand it, right? And I, I think that he is the, the best ever in all creation. That's my thoughts on Jesus. He warns us in Matthew 10, 16 and Luke 10, 3, I will send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. So what imagery does that portray? What are you thinking then? Anybody? Mr. Pittman? put a lamb in the middle of wolves is to have the lamb eaten alive, but the lamb cannot be eaten alive if God is on their side. That's right. That's right. Pretty clear. Question. What are ways that you can, on a daily and practical level, take advantage of what is promised to us in having Jesus as our good shepherd? Anyone? Pause for that. A uh, pastor. I think in practical level, we need to take time to hear the voice of God every day. Yes. The agenda of God for us. That is very important because we need to hear 
his voice. And then we need to have the willingness to this position, very good attitude, to follow the, his instruction. Because sometimes his instructions are not, uh, are not similar for our plans. So right. we need to uh, throw down our plans and to follow his plans because sometimes we don't realize how we need or what we need to do because our fears, our pains, and any other uh, obstacles in our life. So we need to be, to hear carefully what he wants to uh, tell us. Thank you. That is exactly what I missed in the first part. If we don't recognize his voice, if we don't spend time with him, how will we know it? Okay, anything else about the shepherd? If not, we'll move on to the suffering Messiah. And I want to start with a question. Uh, while reading the following text, where do you see the details of this psalm fulfilled in the life of Jesus? So Psalms 22, that's where we're going. Does anybody want to read Psalms 22 for me? Okay, we're going to do 22 verse 1, 14 to 18, and 19 to 21. Mr. Pittman? So, um, Kelly, do you want to read the whole psalm? No, uh, Psalms 22, oh, verse 1, 14 okay. to 18. I'll remind everybody, I made the verses very big because I want you to look it up. I don't want you to read the screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. And then... Uh, 14, 14 to 18. 14 to 18. Uh, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. And then 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. but, he, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now this is Psalms, Old Testament. Did everything come to pass? Yeah. We'll go to Matthew. Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Pastor, Lama. Okay. Uh, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was finished. So in comparison between the two, We're looking at Matthew and Mark versus Psalms. The words of the Jesus are the same. The feelings of Jesus are the same. They shake their heads in mockery. That imagery is still the same. The words of the crowd are almost verbatim. The trust and experience of God. Jesus is thirsty. What is he thirsting for? Water, do you think? He was thirsty for water? It, it was physical because he was 
disconnected. No, no, he was physical. Christ came to live among us as a human being. So not only did he suffer, we know the greatest and, and most intense suffering was was the was his mind thinking that he was going to be separated from his father. But he also had he he felt the blows placed upon him when they tore his hair and grabbed his beard and lashed his back. He felt all that, and he, he labored breathing for us. And then when he said, I thirst, he wanted something to drink. He, he, and he needed and longed for sympathy. And we know David is a prophet here, and he, he gives us the insights of Christ, what he went through. He felt forsaken. And that's why I think I mentioned before, never, never should we ever uh, quote that verse when we're going tr through trials. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in Deuteronomy, we're told, I will never leave you nor forsake thee. So yes, Jesus did. He did cry out for, for physical needs. I was thinking at the same time too, um, when we're given the um, imagery, of Lazarus and the rich man in heaven and the rich man saying, you know, I thirst. My parched, have Lazarus just put a little water. You know, I was thinking about that too. If he was completely disconnected, like, why have you forsaken me? He's completely disconnected. I thirst. You know, send me the healing water. That, that image kind of came into my head too. And spiritually, he was completely disconnected. They pierced the hands and feet of Jesus. They did not break any of his bones, and the soldiers divided their clothes. So everything we just read in Psalms was in Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke. For those that are online... Psalm 118, the stone which the builders refused is become the head cornerstone. We also find that in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The reflection, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. Who would like to read that for me? Hands up. Over here. Ms. Pittman. First Peter two twenty one to twenty five. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are not returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. Amen. Any further thought from Monday's lesson? Jesus thirsted for mercy. Mercy because everybody knew that the God who loved him was a God that had the power of all the plagues of Egypt. He had the, the power to do anything in this world. He had the power to open up the seas and, and let his people through. He had all this power. And he showed his power through Jesus, and Jesus thirsted for mercy because 
he was of God. And yet, where's Mary, the, the one who, who was impregnated by the spirit of Joseph and knew that he was of God and yet saw all the miracles that he did and then she's kneeling at the bottom of the cross going, what's going on? What happened? You're, you're crucifying God in himself in not having any mercy for a man who showed the whole of Rome what the power was and what did the church do? They crucified him with the Romans, with the people who knew. And his, his death and his resurrection was made into something astounding, not even looking at the suffering for mercy. Anything that is not of love and compassion in this world is not of God. And how much suffering is done for everybody in this world? Who doesn't suffer? Who doesn't suffer at the hands of taxes still reamed on the poor and the, the hungry out there on the streets being spit on? And they are of God. They are where God is. And God is full of love and compassion, yet we show so very little in this world. Um, does anybody want to talk about the worm reference in Monday's lesson before we move on? Thinking about what you just said. Because in Psalm 22, is, he's compared as a worm. When we think of a worm, I mean, you can't get any lower, right? And that's the way we treated him. And that's the way we treat our fellow man sometimes. And that's, that's hard to take. But dust we are, uh, and dust we will return. Tuesday's lesson, forever faithful to his covenant. Is a covenant a contract? It's open debate. Covenant a contract? Is it the same? Miss Pittman over here, Mr. Ruth. Yes. You, you can look at it as a contract because uh, each, each party has a role. So God has promised to take care of us, but we have to submit to him. So there is, there is a two-way. Okay. So you can look at it as a contract. Uh, both parties will have a role to play. So. Anybody else? Bob, over here. Um, yeah, so there, the covenant, I, I think there's, you can divide it into two categories. So there's a bilateral covenant mm. in which there's an agreement between God and, and his people. And I think an example of that is the covenant of salvation by grace. So God offers us salvation through Christ. You know, in the Old Testament, they look forward to the Messiah and our, us, you know, 2,000 years later, look back to the Messiah for that salvation uh, through grace and our faith, and so it's uh, it's up to us to to believe and and obey Christ and worship Him as far as that covenant goes. And then there's also a unilateral covenant where no human need respond. So God says, you know, I'm providing, uh, I will establish a kingdom through the Messiah Jesus, and He's going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but our salvation is de dependent on a response. I think, and I guess another example of a covenant would be after the Noah and the flood. Uh, there was a, a the rainbow was a covenant between God and, and man that um, you know He will be with us and that He won't He won't get rid of mankind again uh, with with a flood. So that was it's not something that required a response. It was just a unilateral covenant. 
Yes. Yeah. So unlike a contract, covenants can be unilateral. And uh, with David, I mean, he's promised the line, and we know that Jesus was in the line of David. Um, and even though humans failed over and over and over again, the, they suffered the consequences of their actions. But at the end of the day, God remembered, and he reigns, and he's keeping up his end of the bargain. Anybody want to read Psalm 89 for me? Over here, Mr. Pittman. Keeping you on your toes today, sir. It's a short one. Psalm 89. Mm -hmm. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. In the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the region of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Taba and Haman, rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of your strength. And in your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our king to the Holy One of Israel. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One, and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him, with whom, had, with whom my hand shall establish. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. Okay, okay sorry. I got mixed up between 89 and 110. I was thinking that was the short Ooh. one. That was the long one. Very long okay, one, yeah. so we do get the with right. David and we know a little bit the anointing. So that's good. Sorry about that. Okay. I, should, uh, I, wrote, I didn't write down the, the verses range there. Um, I was like, that, that went a little longer than I thought. There. <laughs> but we get the point. Okay, so the seed. So when we think about seed, and um, does anything come to mind? What else could seed be? Seed. Um, I guess seed can mean just descendants. Mm -hmm. um, so in this context of the covenant, I think a, you know Abrahamic and um, uh, David, the seed of David, which, which Christ comes from. And this goes back to uh, God's introduction of grace in, in the Garden of Eden to uh, his people in Genesis 3.15 when he said, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, the church, and between thy seed and her seed, Jesus, mm -hmm. and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Um, so the seed here, of course, is the Messiah, uh, Jesus. Um, and, you know, throughout the Bible, there's references to, the, to, to seed, such as Galatians 3.16. Um, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, 
but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And um, yeah, Luke 1, 31 to 33 um, talks about, you know, uh, Jesus being conceived in the womb, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the Messiah. So it's the fulfillment of that kind of first introduction in Genesis to the seed. Uh, and it says, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So, you know, complete fulfillment, right? He, he's in the line of David. Um, he is the son of God. He's totally divine, totally perfect and uh, authorized by God the father. You know, can't get any clearer than that. Yes. Um, yeah. So as, as uh, Bob was saying, the, uh, the seed can be descendants or offspring. And we, we go back to the beginning where, you know, we're, we come from Adam and Eve originally. Uh, and then you go into David, and David is saying, you know, he's in line, Jesus is in the line of David. But then God is saying, this is my son. So you're, go you're going full timeline here. So, in short, the human component of the covenant failed. But Jesus Christ is the son of David and the Messiah. He is called the firstborn over all creation, which calls David, um, who was a type of Christ, God's firstborn. Also, I will make him my firstborn. So, understanding is, is uh, takes some study. <laughs> Colossians 1, 16, 20 to 22. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, I love but, but, but now he has re reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present, you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Question. That, was, that imagery, right? Okay, Tuesday. What do these verses teach us about who Jesus was and what he has done for us? Anyone? He gave his life willingly. He gave his life willingly because he knew it was God's plan for him. And it had to be done to uh, teach people the way of life. And the way of life of Christ is nothing more than love and compassion. Mm -hmm. The way of God is knowing the order of things. He is the only two commandments that make any sense is love the Lord thy God with all your heart and soul. There is no more, nothing on this earth more than he is. He created everything. He created life, and life is in the trees and the animals and the people, and we are supposed to, supposed to, with the covenant of God, protect his creation uh, instead of ourselves. So therefore, Whatever God asks you to do, you do willingly because he is the one you love the most. And then the next commandment is to love every living thing as you love yourself. It's as simple as that. Heather and Bob. In these verses, in uh, verse 16, Colossians 1, 16, it says that God is, is our creator and sustainer. And so he has created us. He created us to be holy and to follow him. But through, through sin, we, our, our natures have been changed. But then in verse, 
21, it says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So God is our creator, and he's our, our redeemer. So there's two things that those verses bring out. That's right. Okay. Hey, Bob, did you want to elaborate on that? No, okay, you're good. Okay, so moving on to Thursday's lesson. Eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. So I thought this was simple first, and then <laughs> started studying. Um, when you picture the footstool, Eastern kings place their feet on the necks of the, their defeated enemies to demonstrate total dominance over them. And you picture the rod and the staff, and in Psalm 23, the rod and thy staff, it comforts me. So you're getting two different images here, but... Ultimately, at the end, we know that God does conquer. Uh, Matthew 27, um, you think about where the Pharisees went to Pilate and they wanted to uh, put watch over the opening of the gate, of, of the tomb. And we know how uh, silly that was because we know that God was going to rise no matter what in three days and it was spiritual, but man, they thought, okay, I'm going to put the the guards here in front of this, and they're not going to be able to take his body, and then they won't, nobody will believe them. Um, it was vain. Couldn't prevent what, that God, what God had established. So that goes in to who was Melchizedek? Let's go right into there. Anyone? Heather? When Abraham was living in the land of Canaan, there was, uh, there was um, a war that happened uh, between city states, I guess. And uh, it was five kings against four. Anyway, the outcome was that um, the city that his nephew was living in, Sodom, was attacked and it was uh, sacked. And the people who lived there were taken captives. And word came to Abraham and he took the men that were in his camp and he went after uh, the kings that had attacked Sodom and the other, um, the other cities in the Vale. And uh, when he was coming back from being victorious, uh, recapturing the, the hostages or whatever, uh, he was met by Melchizedek and he was the king of Salem and he was also a high priest and he paid tithes to Melchizedek. And also, uh, we're told that Mel Melchizedek doesn't have a genealogy. He has no beginning nor end, so he's the type of Christ. He was not Christ, but he represents Christ in that he, he is a priest forever. Yeah, he wasn't on the line of Levite that we're aware of. No, he wasn't a Levite because we're told, in I think, in Hebrews that Abraham paid tithes. Mm -hmm. it, uh, Levi paid tithes through the loins of Abraham. So we know that this priest was higher than um, the, the Levitical priests because they pay tithes to Melchizedek. So it kind of gives us an image of what's to come. So he was the king of um, Salem, brought, oh sorry, yeah, he brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram to God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything in Genesis, which I want to remind everybody, tithe was before the Ten Commandments. Um, so, you know, we were thinking, and I had thought about Psalm 110 when I had asked the lovely lady over here to read. Uh, but in Psalm 110, uh, so there's strong language. Uh, so we have a conquering king. There's a day of wrath coming. And there's final um, God is over all kings. But kings will give the opportunity to repent. So 
So even though in the end we're all, you know, Jesus is coming, he is the high priest. It would be better to do it this way. He's a celestial priest. An oath establishes Jesus as king. An oath establishes him as a priest. We're 132.11 and Psalms 110.4. As a member of the tribe of Judah, Jesus was excluded from priesthood. However, God himself declared him a priest according to ministry superior to and prior to the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews 7.14.15. In what ways is the priesthood of Jesus superior? We'll end on here. Hebrews 6, if you want to turn with me, Hebrews 6, uh, 19 to 20, 7, 1 to 3, 7, 20 to 28. And I've had a it's very tiny from there. I apologize, everyone. So seven, Hebrews 7, 21, it says it is based on an oath. Hebrews 9, 24 exercise his ministry in the celestial sanctuary. Hebrews 7, 23 to 24, he is not affected by death. Hebrews 7, verse 25, his intercession and salvation are continuous. Hebrews 7, 26, he is perfect and compassionate, as was said. Hebrews 6, 20, he can represent us directly before the Father. Jesus' wonderful royal priesthood makes an absolute claim on our obedience and trust. So he is high priest. He is king. He rules over us all. We are to pay tithes to him. And does anybody want to add to that? Pastor. Oh, Jesus Christ is superior in all dimensions. Yes. But the, the, the most important in practical implication that is accessible for all us sinners. Mm. The, so how can I access this wonderful high priest when we pray? Just when you pray and I pray, through Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of the grace of God. But uh, sometimes we forget pray. Yes. It's a simple. Jesus is a superior, is a superior in all dimension. He is pouring out his Holy Spirit in us in order to be faithful in uh, obedience of his Ten Commandments, because the Holy Spirit write, writes the Ten Commandments in our minds, in our heart. This is a new covenant. Right. So it, the implication is, wow, in many dimensions, in all dimensions, in health, in mind, in our emotions, in all dimensions, uh, this practical <clears throat> intercession of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places is so important. It's the core of our belief here. So, thank you. Anyone else? Ellen G. White says, After the fall, he saw his sheep doomed to perish in the dark ways of sin. To save these wandering ones, he left the honors and glories of his father's house. His voice is heard calling them to his fold, a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. Isaiah 4, 6. His care for the flock is unwearied. He strengthens the weak, relieves the suffering gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them in his bosom his sheep love him okay. uh, no i just wanted to say um you know it's interesting that this, 
the Hebrews talks about the sanctuary, and a lot of people have trouble with that. I mean, our denomination doesn't. Mm. Uh, well, some people probably do. I don't know. But to me, it's, it's clearly stated in the Bible, Christ is in the sanctuary ministering on our behalf. And it's, it's through that that we can get, you know, uh, forgiveness for sin. And, and that it's, it's imperative that we do that as Christians and want to get our sins, you know, out of the book of iniquity um, for the end. But not only is it there and people can choose to believe or not believe, but the Old Testament here, like in Psalm 110, clearly outlines that whole plan. Yes. Clearly outlines it. And... You know, at the end, it says um, that Jesus will rise up and, you know, he's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and he will rise up and he will judge the heat. And it talks about the wrath of God at the second coming of the Messiah in verse 6. Uh, verse 7 talks about the brook, uh, of, um, the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. So the brook is like peaceful living, living waters from mm -hmm. Christ. And so at this point, the judgment is finished. He and we who are with him are victors, mm -hmm. and he lifts up our heads to show us that it's over. It's done. It's completed. Yeah. He is the ruler of all. Like it's, it's, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's so complex, but yet so simple. I mean, the Old Testament tells us this hundreds of years before Christ came, mm -hmm. so we can have plenty of faith in it. Absolutely. That's right. Everything we read in the Old Testament is mirrored in the New Testament. It happened, so we can trust that what it says in Revelation will happen, and we're almost there. So let's end in prayer. Oh, Lord in heaven, I want to thank you so much for being these people here today. I pray that those that are listening online and those that are sitting in, in the pews here, Lord, that they received a blessing and have learned something today and can take that away. We can have a practical approach. You are just... A prayer away. You're always listening, Lord, and you're there to forgive us, to bring us close to your bosom, to forgive us of our sins, to wash us whiter than snow, and you're there to intercede. We take that with us for the remainder of today and the rest of this week. Amen.